We are all used to the streets of our cities being hectic, smelly and noisy. Always have been, always will be, right? It's up to us to find our way through the traffic. What other options do we have? More than half of us humans now live in cities that are getting ever more crowded. But for generations, cities have been built for cars, not humans, causing traffic jams and pollution. Many cities are already very unhealthy, and the climate crisis could make them unlivable within our lifetime. Japan is experiencing a record-breaking heat wave. India recently recorded its highest ever temperature. Paris has just hit its highest ever temperature. Some people say we can rethink the cities we live in and make them better. But what does that actually mean? How could we reclaim and reuse our own cities to make them cooler and cleaner, and us happier and healthier? We're about to see how some cities in Europe are finding solutions to their own urban issues. The French capital Paris is experiencing a new revolution on its streets. We thought for two centuries that we were in the progress and that the future would be better than before. And now today we see it's completely reversed. Here it's a huge transformation. It's Bastille. Before, the cars are turning all around. But now you have a big pedestrian area. Barcelona in Spain is making the most of the city's unique design to revitalize its streets. Calles donde la gente es el protagonista y los coches son un agente invitado. Está muy bien que los niños por arriba en bici se peligran en los coches. And they're learning a lot from this place, Groningen in the Netherlands. A lot of people like to see the car in front of their house. But what we do is ask the people, what kind of streets do you want? And that's a question that still divides opinion among city dwellers. Tu Barcelona cruzabas en 35 minutos máximo. La estás cruzando en 1.45. It's nice on the paper. It's a waste of time and money. What Paris would need would need less concept and more doers. How can we work to improve our cities if the benefits aren't clear to everyone? The narrative should not be about cars versus bikes. It should really be about the deeper values that people have. You might think the Netherlands is too obvious a choice to start exploring people-friendly streets. But do you know how hard Dutch people had to fight for them? These moments of change have never been easy. And many people think that in the Netherlands this always was the case. But also in the Netherlands it took radical change, like literally urban warfare in the 1970s, of people going to the street and demand the streets back. So in the Netherlands you had the movement that was called Stop the Child Murder in the 1970s. And that movement really managed to gather people to reclaim the streets that at that time were really engineered towards providing more space for cars. This is Marco T. Brummelstrut, a.k.a. the Cycling Professor. He heads the Faculty of Urban Mobility Futures at the University of Amsterdam and mentors the next generation of urban planners in land use and mobility. What is missing in our current conversation about rethinking urban transportation planning? Marco also shares a lot of ideas on social media about how we use our cities. The streets in our cities always were the remaining space between buildings. And in that remaining space between buildings, everything happened. Social life happened, trading happened, children could play, people could meet, and people could travel through them. But this changed radically in the 1920s, 100 years ago, and that was the pressure that was introduced by the motorized vehicle. Cars came in large numbers to that street and basically put pressure on the way that we were thinking about the street, and literally colliding with all these other purposes that were happening in its space. And to respond to that, a whole new domain of thinking was introduced. So traffic engineering sort of was born in the 1930s and developed a language around seeing streets as places where people want to go as fast as possible as individuals. And because of that, it started to solidify into institutions and into laws, into behavior. It solidified into concrete, asphalt and technology. And finally, it solidified our imagination. Or we now take it for granted that we think about our streets as places that are primarily there for vehicular in every city in the land, children are dodging traffic wheels at their play. Too frequently, their merry shouts are accompanied by the ominous clang of the ambulance bell. 
The combination of a ball, a bicycle, or roller skates, and a city street represents a deadly menace to children's safety. The way that we develop our streets with this logic makes our streets unsustainable, unlivable, unsafe, and maybe even unjust. So we don't think about streets as places in terms of justice. And that's how we thought about them until the 1920s. They are no longer a place where our children can play or can find out how they autonomously can go through the city and become an adult citizen. And this is something that society now slowly is starting to realize that this is unacceptable. We need new narratives, and as soon as you start using them, we see that people suddenly start seeing the street for what it really is and they start understanding that there's something to fight for. Yeah, I think there is a political or societal movement of people that are sort of wakening up to this idea that you can actually tell different stories and different narratives. Like for instance, shifting from we are closing streets off for one day, instead of that saying we're opening streets for one day and suddenly we see what that does with people and that people start realizing, oh wait a minute, we have been accepting our language, our narratives about the streets. What if we challenge them? And I think that we see globally this movement slowly gathering momentum. And now what it needs is sort of a couple of seeds of places that show what can happen if you really recapture that narrative. One person already planting seeds is Jan Kamensky. His animations invite the viewer to imagine how streets could look if space for cars were replaced with space for people. For Jan, sharing these utopian visions is a playful way to question how we think about our cities. I no longer wanted to wait for the increasingly urgent social change, but to make a contribution myself. And as a communication designer, I decided to make streets without cars visible. And I realized that there was so much space to create and show possibilities of what we could do with the streets without cars. Bicycles, or feats as the Dutch call them, are key to their sustainable city concept. We asked the cycling professor to explain how. The Netherlands and Amsterdam is a good example of what happens if cycling gets a respected place at the table of traffic engineering. And what they show us is what happens if you take cyclists or human behavior as a central element in design, instead of how can you make humans behave according to your design. And in Amsterdam we have some places where we experimented with what happens if you eradicate the traffic light logic on an intersection. So this intersection was redesigned because there were so many cyclists compared to car drivers that the municipality considered what would happen if we take out the traffic lights. And the traffic lights actually ensured that car drivers could go through, but didn't really make it safer. So they did a test, they took out the traffic lights, and one of the peculiar findings of the elderman that did it was, if you take out the traffic lights, people start to behave like active citizens again. So they are not looking at the light, but they're looking at each other and negotiating with each other how to use the intersection. Of course, Amsterdam could have turned out rather differently if they hadn't blocked US-inspired city makeovers like the Jokinen plan in the 1960s. Other Dutch cities like Utrecht have been rolling back car-centric planning. Goodbye urban highway, welcome back original city canal. Then there's Groningen. It chose human-centered planning in the 70s and is now ranked as one of the happiest places in the world. We met two of the people responsible for keeping it that way. Back in the 70s, the center of Groningen was totally different than today. The central part of the city, the Grote Mark, our central square, this was a place where cars were driving around when you went from the south of Groningen to the north of in the province. In the 70s, we decided that has to stop. We chose to make a city traffic plan where our center was divided in four parts and it was not possible to move from the one part to the other with a car, only with food or bike. It was a totally new concept of thinking about our city. We were one of the first cities in Europe to rethink the use of the city centre.
concept uh, concept in Paris. I think it's a way we design our city already. The concept that in 50 minutes you have to reach your work, your school, you reach your center, reach your shops. It's the way we designed the last 25 years our city center. This example in Paris or in Groningen is very useful for a lot of cities in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. Now that central Groningen has been calmed, city managers like Ingrid Bolhoys are turning their attention to the outskirts. This is the Bedemeweg, a street with a very functional design. There are a lot of concrete lanes for the car. There are side roads with a lot of car parking. And there are sidewalks with a lot of bicycle parking. So we see a lot of opportunities for change. There are two neighborhoods which are divided by this road. So we want to bring the neighborhoods together for a public space. We made this an example for how uh, the city could look like. you think of Groningen, uh, the first thing you think is the prominent place of the bike. And when you walk through the city center, but also through our neighborhoods, you see bikes everywhere. In Groningen, more than 60% of the movements in our traffic is made by the bike. Not the car, but the bike is the basic uh, where we are making urban plans for traffic. So I think that will be the next step in Groningen as the most bike-friendly city of the world. We're standing next to the smart route to our university campus in Groningen. And this uh, route is an alternative for another cycling path next to a very busy road. And we wanted to give the cyclists an alternative. And it's heavily used because there are normally 25,000 cyclists on this route a day. And this is an example of an early living street. It's made years ago in the 90s. People wanted here to have a greener, more livable street. It used to look like a normal street with parking on one side, uh, now it's turned into to this. So it's an example of how we want to do the rest of the city. In Groningen we made a choice to make more space in our streets for green, more space for people. So the consequence is that we have less space for cars. And that's not always an easy choice because a lot of people also in Groningen uh, are dependent of the car. Also a lot of people like to see the car in front of their house. But what we do is ask the people what kind of streets do you want? And that's a different question than where do you want to park your car? But then everyone says well now in front of our house and I don't want to pay for it. That's what everyone who owns a car will say. We ask what kind of street do you want? And a lot of people say, oh, we like to see a street where children can play, there are some trees, where it's nice and easy to meet your neighbor. And when you start with that question, the discussion will change. What if people in other cities were asked what kind of streets they want? With some cities, it's easy to imagine a difference, as Jan points out. This is an animation in Brussels, and I used an historic postcard, which is over 100 years old, to show that city streets were possible without cars in the past and they will be possible in the future as well. And now I had the idea to bring back the wildness into the city and to show the connection between humans and the nature. Obviously is real, but we forgot about it. And yeah, this is a human-friendly place again. Squeezed between the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains, Barcelona has the highest car density and one of the highest population densities in Europe. But thanks to a quirk of 19th century planning, this iconic European city is undergoing its own special transformation. The city government wants to convert a million square meters of road surface into space for local people. The city's unique grid pattern dates back to 1859 and the pre-car redesign by Ildefonse Cerda. This layout is the key to Barcelona's plans. Groups of individual blocks are closed to through traffic, but as in Honingen, they remain open for local use and for commercial and emergency needs. Barcelona basically built their superblocks idea on that idea of Groningen of 40 years ago. The idea that you can still allow car traffic to go everywhere as long as you lower the speeds of cars and you don't allow through traffic. So much of that car traffic you will find is not necessary and the car traffic that is necessary can still go to places where they want to be. But as soon as you do that, you start unlocking that street. For the people that live there, they suddenly realize how much space they actually reclaimed, how much space they now have to sit to meet 
each other and how much space and freedom the children suddenly have if there's no longer car traffic everywhere. And that also frees up the parents because no longer have to chauffeur the children everywhere because there's much less danger around. We visited a super block near the Sant Antoni market to see for ourselves. They're actually known locally as Super Ias or Super Islands, which seems to fit better. Their originator, Salvador Rueda, told us the goal was to cut traffic noise pollution without clamping down on car use. In the case of Barcelona, the model that we have designed liberates 70% of the space today dedicated to the mobility, reducing only 15% of cars. It's almost magic. This space is a place that was before an intersection of streets filled with cars. We managed to convert it from a place of asphalt and filled with cars into a place filled with life. What we are talking about here is that all the citizens' rights can be developed, among them the game of the children, juego de los niños, pero también la del entretenimiento o se generan, digamos, manifestaciones culturales, artísticas, de debate y el ciudadano lo es cuando puede desarrollar todos sus derechos, no solamente el del desplazamiento. A new generation in Barcelona is growing up knowing that the streets can belong to everyone thanks to the bici bus or bike bus. Every Friday the children cycle to school with traffic stopped on their route. And on this cold winter's day in Barcelona, most people out and about were happy about the changes to their neighborhood. I think it's great to have safe spaces out where you can hang out with people or, like me, read a book and just enjoy the city. Pues la verdad que muy bien. Es un concepto que hasta ahora en Barcelona no, no existía y que creo que a pesar que puede generar algunos inconvenientes indirectos, los beneficios son superiores, sin ningún lugar a dudas. Sobre todo que la ciudad es más vivida por las personas. La gente se hace propietaria de la calle y la verdad es que se respira mucha más vida ahora que no antes. Janet Sanz is Barcelona's deputy mayor for ecology, urbanism and mobility. She says the pilot project's successes inspired her team to think bigger. Funcionó muy bien. Ya le hemos dicho, ¿por qué no toda Barcelona, no? ¿Por qué no toda la ciudad? Pero imaginándonos que la ciudad en el año 2030 sea una cosa completamente diferente. Lo que tiene que pasar en nuestras calles es que la gente tenga más espacio para caminar, para jugar, para estar o para desarrollar actividades económicas, pero también tiene que haber más espacio para el transporte público, para ir en bicicleta y para movernos diferente. The government is prioritizing community participation, but vocal critics remain. Olga runs a Porsche garage in downtown Barcelona and misses the freedom to drive. Tenía un urbanismo de circulación prácticamente perfecto. Una ronda circular exterior y unas líneas que se entrecruzan de derecha a izquierda, que suben y bajan, que es el plan Cerda, que nos permite unir todos los barrios de la ciudad de una forma muy rápida. De hecho, tú Barcelona cruzabas en 35 minutos máximo. La estás cruzando en 1.45. Nuria heads the Barcelona Tourism Association and isn't happy with the planning process. Y nosotros lo que queremos es no tener que escoger entre sostenibilidad y economía. Y ahora estamos definiendo unas superillas que no se ha hecho ni siquiera una de las peticiones que hemos tenido desde el momento cero, que es un informe sobre el impacto económico que tendrían estos cambios urbanísticos en una zona como es el Eixample, que es un modelo a seguir y que se ha estudiado en todo el mundo porque contempla todos los usos. Monica Jouffre leads a citizens group opposing tighter traffic laws, such as banning diesel cars made before 2006. What is the ecologist? For me, to buy a new car makes no sense. I have a car that works perfect. Why I should to destroy something that works perfect and buy a new one? The city government is convinced it has enough public backing and is pushing on. Unos 350.000 coches cruzan la ciudad de Barcelona por el centro, donde hay escuelas, mucha gente viviendo. Todo eso tiene que cambiar. Más transporte público, menos coches contaminantes, que para los viajes indispensables que se deban hacer en vehículo, en coche, se haga en vehículo no contaminante. Y además, pues tienen que haber ejes donde los coches no sean protagonistas. Y eso es Superilla Barcelona. Calles donde la gente es el protagonista y los coches son un agente invitado. 
Marco T. Brumestrut sees Barcelona facing the same debates as Dutch cities in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, what we see in all these changes, and in general in change, is that people resist. We have to take that uh, uh, seriously, because they resist because some people will lose something. Again, the example of children. Children have been losing their freedom for decades, but they don't have a voice. So the people that will currently lose, well, first of all, their loss will be relatively small, as we see from many examples. We still have to allocate the traffic required for people that really need it. But all the other things that are lost, sort of the freedom to go through a city with your uh, personal private vehicle as fast as possible, yeah, you will lose that. But because of that, so many others, and even yourself, you will win so much as well. And we need to unlock all these people that currently don't have a voice, and the silent majority that's actually losing out already for decades. Even in car-mad Germany, the narrative is shifting. But Jan Kamensky can find plenty of examples in his hometown of Hamburg in need of change. So we are now at the Holzenplatz in Hamburg and 100 years ago this already has been a beautiful place. What we see now is a total mess. This place is dominated by cars and traffic and with my animation I wanted to show a transformation into a human-friendly place which is enjoyable for people. Jan has also turned his utopian imagination to one of the largest, oldest cities in Europe. The one with the continent's highest population density. It's also a city that has come up with its own ideas of a livable city and has started turning the dream into reality, the French capital. Paris is so inspiring for us because it shows that if you develop a new narrative, it can actually convince people. But the narrative should not be about cars versus bikes. It should really be about the deeper values that people have. And the 15-minute city gives us this narrative. It talks about a meaningful life that is not requiring fast mobility. This means that the relation that citizens have with the street, with the city, and with each other can radically change. More about the 15-minute city later. First, why? Anne Hidalgo became mayor of Paris in 2014 with her pledge to make the capital more livable. Parisians were ready for change after years of deadly summer heat. In a period of six weeks from late July to the end of August, over 15,000 people were killed in France by heat exhaustion, dehydration and heat stroke. Most of the dead were elderly. On one day alone, a day that's now known as Black Monday, 3,000 Parisians died. Dozens of schools will be closed in parts of France on Thursday, with temperatures forecast to soar above 40 degrees Celsius. Paris has had its hottest day ever. Climate scientists say such heat waves are likely to become the new normal in the coming years. Why should Paris be so under threat from rising temperatures? For Roxane Meniers of the capital's Climate Academy, it's down to typical city design. These heat waves are more harsh in dense city centres such as Paris because of the urban heat island effect, which is basically the fact that in city centres the temperatures are higher than in the surrounding countryside. This effect is due to a variety of factors and a lot of them can be linked to urban planning and how the city is evolving and is designed. In Paris especially we have very narrow streets and often high buildings, so the sun rays reflect a lot on various surfaces and that accentuates the increasing temperatures. This also means that you have less wind and we need wind for cooling effects. The green areas and the water bodies are quite scarce in urban settings and in Paris in particular, so it adds to the heat effect. Of course, heat emissions, which are directly due to human activities, such as the emissions from vehicles, from industries. So many of these causes can actually be tackled by different urban planning. It's now eight years since Anne Hidalgo launched her revolutionary project. We asked some Parisians what they had noticed. I don't think there is less cars, but I think there's more bikes. Obviously, if you build more bike lanes, there will be more bikes. You know, it's not if you have more bikes that you have to build more bike lanes. It's the other way around. If you build them, bikes will come. And maybe in a few years, there will be less and less cars. And it's obvious that you just can't take your car for like five minutes. So yeah, I think it's completely possible. 
Few people in Paris are better placed to talk about bikes than Altis, a cyclist who broadcasts his rides live on Twitch and keeps his large social media following up to date with the changes. Altis took us on a bike ride to see what had happened to the streets of Paris over the last eight years. You can see a lot of yellow on the floor. That means it's kind of experimentation. They are not sure if they are going to let the thing like that. They just test if it's working or not. And when it's work, they change. When it's not working, sometimes they do another stuff. So here we are in Rivoli. And you can see now all of this place is for riding by bike. Before, it was car everywhere. And they start by adding this little lane. And after, they expand to this place. So now it's very nice place to ride. So here we are in La Bastille. You have to imagine before all of this place, it's for car. Car can pass here for turning all around this place for nobody who can really walk or live. No, they just remove that and you can just enjoy this place for live now. So here you can see we are close to La Seine and this place was only for car. No, the circulation is completely cut and only pedestrians and cyclists can use this space. So it's bringing a lot of life. The 15-minute city idea was developed by urban planner Carlos Moreno to give Paris a solid ecological, economic and social foundation in future. The 15 minutes to the concept is a new paradigm for living differently in cities. We wanted to reduce the CO2 emissions and at the same time we wanted to bring the quality of life for developing intense activity in proximity. We wanted to promote a city based on different centers, different places for living to reduce the role of individual cars. This is a new path for having the human at the center of city. Ecology, proximity, solidarity, and uh, citizen empowerment are the four pillars. The role of bike in a city as Paris is very crucial. The role of car is not, in fact, uh, in the center of cities, in the high density zone. Sorry for each one of the drivers that consider the public space uh, is only for uh, going with my car. The role of car is an other point, in particular, for going for uh, 20, 40 kilometers, but not for the very short-term movements. So, if the 15-minute city idea is a cornerstone of the current plans to transform Paris for good, you'd expect the city to be abuzz with talk about it, right? Uh, no, first time I heard for, for 15 minutes. No, I don't know the project 15 minutes uh, city. I don't know that project. I don't know the 15 minutes city concept. I mean, this thing is just for communication. It was a good concept, but it's... I mean, it doesn't mean anything. 15 minutes in Paris, I mean, what does it mean? I don't know. So they closed the street recently uh, to cars. So now it's open to, to kids or uh, to like people like me uh, doing skateboard. Yes, it is positive for the neighborhood. It's the very beginning of something, I think. It's not much yet, but it's the beginning. And there are other beginnings. A 250 million euro makeover of the Champs-Élysées. We spoke to the architect entrusted with breathing new life into the heart of the capital. Paris is uh, one of old European cities, and like most cities in the 70s, it's a city that has been uh, overwhelmed with cars. And the case of the Champs-Élysées is an interesting example of this problem. It's a very symbolic area in Paris, very famous, but yet something incredible that the Parisians hate this area. Why? It's because it's an area that used to be, for the past century, a place where you would go for a walk with your children. It was a nice moment. It was the most elegant avenue in Paris that local people loved. 
and we figure out that since 40 years no one want to go there except tourists. The car of course is one of the key problem to give this space back to people and pedestrians because all of this has been treated as a highway entering Paris with two times four lanes going up and down and you have pavement Parisian style that is very noisy so if you go to the Champs-Élysées today it's like it's one of the most noisy places in Paris. Reducing the part of the car, getting this place accessible to people is one first action. Of course, we cannot completely ban cars. It's, it's a big debate in Paris. The mayor has, has been banning cars from the Seine River. There's been a lot of uh, political conflict about that. So I think we have to be careful and being a, a bit scientific about that and less ideology. So that's very important. We want to be very uh, methodological and scientific and not fighting uh, uh, pro or you know, against car. The other aspect also that we want to introduce is uh, understanding better the way nature in the city is working as an ecosystem. The climate change, we're gonna have a lot of uh, warm spot in Paris and this avenue is very hot spot. So how can you use a natural element to cool down the city? But that is a simple conclusion to a more larger and more scientific study, which is to say, how can we have tomorrow the scientific knowledge of reducing our carbon footprint on Earth? And that's where working on all the cities because that's where 85% of the damage are produced on 2% of the surface of the planet. Changing the city is not something you do overnight. This vision we propose is started in 2025, it's maybe going to be done in 2035. It might sound like Paris is taking the long view, but for a city that counts its age in millennia, 15 to 20 years is a very short spin of the wheel. Much depends on whether Parisians are ready to support this revolution on their streets. Barcelona has overcome early opposition to score some quick wins, but here too, the hardest work is still to come. And 50 years after starting to reclaim their streets, Dutch cities such as Amsterdam and Groningen must still work hard to put humans ahead of cars. What will other cities do about their automotive love affair? While individual vehicles choke our streets, pedestrian activity and bicycle use can be rare and unsafe. Can people living in the megacities of the 21st century expect policymakers to tackle pollution and mitigate climate change? The best time to reclaim our streets was yesterday, but I think the second best time is today. And it's so important because many challenges that we face as society in terms of global sustainability, but also local livability, can no longer be solved if we do not reclaim our streets as public spaces of places that are there to support not only the throughput of vehicles, but to support the thriving of our societies. We'll leave the last word to Jan and the dangers of greenwashing our traffic problems away. If you've got this far, thanks for watching. Please tell us in the comments about living in your city and make sure to like and subscribe to Rev if you want to see more films like this.